Today's teaching text is Malachi chapter 4, and I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. The day of the Lord. For look, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the store. You will trample the wicked, for they will, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. Remember the instruction of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinances I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Look, I am going to send the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with the curse. This is the word of the Lord. This is our last Sunday in the book of Malachi, so if today's your first day, welcome, fourth sermon in a series through the prophet Malachi. Fam, the words in Malachi were hard to hear, and as one of the preachers of this church, let me be honest, it's hard to preach it as well, except obviously for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with you every single Sunday. That's the good part of the sermon. We believe at this church that the whole Bible is God-breathed, and therefore we should read the whole Bible, and therefore we should teach the whole Bible. So it was Malachi's turn, and we took a book, a hard book, and we worked through it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the following about the Word of God. It says, for the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's an intense experience. If you want to experience the Word doing that, then you should read Malachi. And uh, these last four weeks, I don't know about you, but that's the way it's been for me. By the way, as we work through the book of Malachi, did you see that God speaks and when we talk back, then He talks back? Did you see it? The book of Malachi describes our God as a God who is in a dynamic relationship with His people. And if you believe that, then that includes you. God speaks to you. You're welcome to speak back. But then you should know that He also then speaks back to you. So if you say that you have a relationship with God, and you never hear Him speak, and you never hear him speak back to you when you speak back to him, then I don't know if you are in a relationship with God. You might be confessing, lip service, but that's what a relationship with God looks like. And that isn't only true for the people of Malachi, it's true for us as well today. Let's recap the book really quickly. Here's a map of the book. I know it's small, but at least you can see the sections of the book, and at least you can see the headings of the book. Remember, this book is a series of disputes. God talks, the people talk back, God talks back to them. The first part of this book was all about exposing Israel's corruption. The second part of the book has been about confronting Israel's corruption. That's why I said it was a hard book. I mean, exposing and confronting. It's not very friendly words, you know what I mean? It's words that do something to you. You remember at the beginning of chapter 3, let me just show you this little block. In dispute number 4, the day of the Lord was mentioned. And the day of the Lord was mentioned again today in our teaching text, so we'll get back to that. And then if you look top right, you'll see that verses 4 to 6 that Kone just read to us is what we can call a conclusion to the book. And not only a conclusion to the book of Malachi, but actually a conclusion to the whole Old Testament, as it is in our Bible. Look, the next page, in the way that our Bible is arranged, is called the New Testament. So, this is a summary of what the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, or the prophets that fit into that category, are about. Right at the end of the book of Malachi. 
and we are going to read it, and we are going to study it. So that's actually a really good reason to listen to today's sermon. Because if you want to know what this whole part of the Bible is about, we're going to find it in three verses. Isn't that phenomenal? Last week I said that there's a difference between the righteous person and the wicked person. I said uh, the righteous fear God, the righteous know who and whose they are. The righteous don't get rattled when the going gets tough. The righteous don't compare themselves to others and covet what is not theirs. The righteous remain faithful. The righteous remind each other of this truth. And then I said the wicked is pretty much the opposite of that. The wicked is the person who's all about me, myself, and I. You can pretty much just add the word not to all of those distinctives. The wicked does not fear God. The wicked does not know who they are. The wicked does get rattled. The wicked does compare themselves to others. The wicked are not faithful, etc., etc. And then I said last week, if you are righteous, it will lead to something. And then I said, come back for that next week. It's next week now. So I'm glad you're back. Let's see what happens if we respond in a way that the prophet calls us to. That's what our teaching text today describes. Now, it's a short text, so I don't have three points or a leading question with three answers as I usually do, because the text is actually short enough for us to just work through it. You guys ready? Let's pray. Father God, we just read um, that your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. And that your word can work deep, deep inside of us. None of us can even point where the separation is between soul and body and spirit. But that's where you do work through your word. And I pray that that would happen to us this morning. As we wrap up this series, as we wrap up this book as we learn the meaning of the whole Torah and the prophets, I pray that you would do a great work in us. I pray that you would soften our hearts. Give us hearts of flesh again. Hearts that can feel, hearts that can experience you, hearts that can give. Hearts that have a discernment for what it is that you would want us to know, to say and to do. Holy Spirit, illuminate our minds as we work through your word. I pray that in your name. Amen. Let's start then with Malachi uh, chapter 4 verse 1. I made some highlights for you and we are going to work through all of these highlights. So we'll follow the flow first and then we're going to look at the meaning of all of these words so that we can know what the text says, so that we can know what it means and so that we can know what now to do about this text. Now, before we start, I would like to invite you into my time travel machine. Can you guys see it? It's right here. Let's get into the time travel machine and go back 2,400 years. So it's 2024 now, the 28th of April. The world looked vastly different two and a half thousand years ago. That's when this book was written and when these words were spoken. So we have to rewind, if I can just have the slide up again of the map of Malachi, please, Rudolf. We should rewind to a time when Israel looked top left. When they came back from Babylonian ex exile, they settled back in what they called the promised land. And this is more or less a hundred years after they settled back into the land. So think about this. Captivity and exile, hard times. The promise that I'll bring you back, that promise was fulfilled. Once they came back, it was really an underwhelming experience. Have you guys ever like had a really good holiday at a certain spot and then you want to go back? And then when you go back, your second holiday there really sucks because you wanted it to be like your first. Yeah, that's how the Israelites felt. Yay, we're back in the promised land, but my word, it's hard going here. We have to rebuild. We have to start over. We rebuilt the temple and we rebuilt the walls, but it doesn't look as great as it always were. And worship is hardcore. We don't have the pros with us anymore. We have to figure this thing out as we go. It was an underwhelming experience. They were struggling. 
And not only were they struggling, there were a lot of things going on in the community in terms of corruption and sin and their disobedience. So that's where we need to go in our heads in the time travel machine if we want to hear what the text says. Are you guys with me? The time is now 415 BC. Okay, let's follow the flow. The prophet says, and this is speaking God's words, there's a day that's coming. We'll chat about that now. And that day is going to be hardcore. See the word burning. See stubble. See consume. See no root, no branches. Complete wipeout. Boom. That's what's going to happen. And who says this? The Lord of armies. Remember, the people of this time had a vision of heaven, that heaven was filled by angels, that those angels were very powerful, and that those angels were organized into different armies. And each army had a commander, and then there was a commander of the commanders, and then there was a commander of the commanders of the commanders. That's where the title Lord of Armies comes from. So the vision that they had was, whatever happens in the heavenly realm, there's one up top. And that is Yahweh, the God of Israel, the created God, the Lord of armies. So when the prophet says that, it, you can't dispute it. Because the one who says, I'm going to come down with massive force, is the one who can command everything to come down with massive force. Do you guys see it? Okay, so that's where the title, the Lord of armies, come from. Then there's a but which is really important, and then a complete opposite in terms of emotions. We just went from consuming and burning to playfully jumping like calves. And then it finishes with the words trample and a repeat of the day. So that's the flow of these first three verses. Okay. Now like I said, this passage picks up and then further develops the imagery that we saw in the fourth dispute in the beginning of chapter 3 first. And that is the coming of the day of the Lord. So God has appointed that day and that day is supposed to be a day of purifying judgment to consume the wicked from among his people. We'll get there now. And as the conclusion adds, which is now verse 4 to 6, we'll get to that later we see that there is still a future for the remnant. Do you guys remember the remnant? If I can just go back to the map again, please, Rudolf. You'll see over here, the remnant, the faithful remnant, is the group of people that sit around the truth of the word, that read it, that believe it, and that remember what God did for them. Do you guys remember them? Yep. We were with them uh, at the end of our teaching last week. Okay, now for those people, the day of the Lord isn't a threat, but instead it is a cause for joy. It's a day to be happy. It will be like the rays of the rising sun. It will bring life. It will bring healing. It will bring hope for the future. I don't know about you, I'm not a winter guy. So between sunrise and about 10.30 in the winter, Oh, it's hardcore because I'm frozen. But then around 10, 30, 11, especially in Pretoria, the sun starts beaming down a little bit hotter and it feels like you're being defrosted and it feels like life is returning to your toes and to your calves and to your fingers. Huh? And the sun is nice and bright, so bright you want to hang out some laundry, you know what I mean? <laughs> Hanging out laundry in Pretoria at 7 in the morning, useless exercise. But at 10, 10, 30, 11, ooh, there's life. It feels like you're being healed as you stand in the sun. I usually do it just behind a window. So I don't want the wind on me, but I want the sun on me. And then I go, oh, this feels so good. So good. That's what the text says. For the righteous, 
This really hardcore day of purifying judgment will indeed actually be an awesome day that will be life-giving and joyous. It will feel like life is returning back to you. Okay, now, let's just take the day of the Lord as a theme through the Bible because there's a really important shift that happens in the Bible and I don't know if you know it, so I want to teach it to you this morning. Okay, so firstly, do you guys remember that God saved Israel from Egypt. Do you remember that part of the story? It's called the Exodus. They were in a foreign land, and they were slaves. They cried out to God. God saved them. As He saved them, He conquered this massive power of oppression and injustice. And then the Israelites sang a song about it in Exodus 15. And in that song they said, This is the Day of the Lord. So that's where it started. So a day in which God goes swipe. And he wipes out something or someone that threatens his people. So that's where we see the beginning of this theme in the Bible. The day of the Lord. Then what the Israelites did is they celebrated Passover. And Passover was a yearly festival. And during that yearly festival, what did they remember? They remembered the day of the Lord. The day that the Lord dealt decisively and intensely with injustice and oppression in the world that was pointed at His people. But it was a celebration of God doing this to another nation, not to His own nation. And then, as the Israelites live in the promised land, and as they fight other enemies, and as they are threatened once again by other empires, the prophets pick up this theme, and they say, The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. And every time when they announce it, it means that we don't need to worry about our enemies targeting us or oppressing us, because once again, God will, as He did in the history, deal with our enemies on a specific day, a day appointed by Him. So it didn't matter which kingdoms would rise up against them, the prophets would invoke this theme of the day of the Lord, and they would say, if God did it once, He can do it again. Now, the target of the day of the Lord is not their enemies. It's not other nations. It's Israel itself. Do you see it? So now Malachi says, fam, whoa, 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 whoa. You've always rejoiced in the fact that God will wipe out those who threaten His people. You've always rejoiced in the fact that God will save us from others. The problem is the sin inside of this group of people is so prevalent at the moment that God needs to wipe out people inside His own people. Because His own people is now threatening His own people. His own people is breaking what He made good. Previously, His wrath was reserved for others that were not His people. But you guys have fallen so far, you've been so disobedient, you have been uh, so forgetful of the law, that there is so much wickedness inside of you, that now the target of the day of the Lord is you. Can you imagine the hearers of this word and what they must have felt? Because it's awesome to sing this, the, the song of the day of the Lord in Exodus 15. Every year when you celebrate Passover with flute and harp and lyre. And now all of a sudden the prophet goes, God's coming for you. And when he comes for you, it's going to be as hectic as it's been when he came for them. And remember, at that point they had a long history of what it looks like when the arm of God extends into the world. And he wipes out what breaks his good creation. That's intense. So now the people hearing this message go, Oh no. How can we escape this? Is it possible, Malachi? Just asking. Asking for a friend here. Is there any way that I can buy a ticket? Is there any list I can write my, I can write my name on? Because it's hectic, fam. Remember the first three verses, burning, consuming, no root, stubbles only. How can I get an out? Verse 2 says, 
fear my name. That's where it starts. Malachi says, but you who fear my name, for you that day will be awesome. That day you will be jumping like Cheslin Colby and Kurt Lee Arntzer. That's a springbok metaphor, just to help us to understand what playfully jump like calves mean. Are you guys with me? It'll be a joyous occasion for you. But if you don't fear my name, nothing will change. Which means that the corruption will continue. Which means that you'll remain wicked. Which means that if I come to wipe out the wicked, you are part of the wicked. That's a hard word now, isn't it? But that's what the text says. And then God says the righteous will stand and after everything is burned up, only ashes will be left. And then the righteous will trample the wicked by walking over their ash. Why does God say that? So that the righteous shouldn't be worried about the wicked. Because he'll deal with them. Fam, that's a really liberating, encouraging word. Do you know how many wicked people still walk this globe? I know I'm still a sinner and I know I'm also wicked. I'm on the other trajectory though, right? I'm trying to be formed into the image of Christ through the Holy Spirit here. There's still a lot of people building systems of oppression and causing injustice in this world and stealing what is not theirs and hurting what God created. Do you know what our job is? Our job is to leave that judgment to God. And our job is to fear His name and to obey Him and to be salt and light in this world. That's good news. Because remember, that little faithful remnant, that group of people trying to do the right thing and trying to be obedient to the Scriptures, they have it hard. God says, you'll trample the wicked. You'll walk over them once I am done with them. In the day that I am preparing. And that's how Malachi's disputes come to a close. Woo! Hey? Now, like any good infomercial, do you guys remember Verimark TV? But wait, there's more. If you call now. So luckily, luckily there is a little bit more. Which is verse 4 to 6. Okay, now, the final three verses, they're not part of the disputes, okay, and they function more like a conclusion to the book, a little add-on, an epi uh, epilogue. Have you guys ever read a book that's got a foreword and then an epilogue? The epilogue is, I, I just need to say one or two more things, but it didn't really fit into the chapter, so let me just write one more thing. That's what Malachi does here with this concluding appendix, and he does it because he's the last prophet that spoke. Think about this, back in the time machine, when Malachi said those words, or oh, I will strike the land with a curse, God stopped speaking for 400 years. Malachi goes, strike the land with a curse. Boom. Drops mic, leaves. The Israelites go, what? And it just hangs in the air. So his conclusion is supposed to finish the whole story of what the law and the prophets meant. Okay, now let's look at the highlights. There's a command. The command is remember. The command is to remember something very specific. We'll get to that now. Instructions, statutes, and ordinances. Then the prophet Elijah appears on the scene. What? We'll get to that now. And then there is this unbelievable picture of God doing deep work in the hearts of His people. And then it ends with, if you won't allow me to do this work, you will live cursed forever. Hectic. Hectic. Okay, let's look at it. So the reader is called to remember the law. That word instruction is the Hebrew word Torah, which also means the law, which also means the first five books of the Bible. Remember how I told you to love. 
Also remember the other instructions that I gave you. I gave you many instructions to answer the question, well, how should we live? Those are called statutes. Those are called ordinances. So remember everything that I said to my servant Moses. Everything that I commanded him, look at that, at Horeb, for all Israel. Fam, I don't know why we do this. Probably because we're sinful. But sometimes we hear a word from God and we think, ah, luckily that's not for me. Sometimes we read His word and it convicts us and we go, I'm so lucky and happy that this word is not for me. Forgiveness. I don't have any issues with forgiveness. I'm good. And then we pass. Generosity. Pass. Faithfulness. Pass. Holiness. Pass. Sharing and witnessing. Pass. We shouldn't do that. Everything that God said to His servant Moses is for all Israel. Counts for everyone. And so does this word count for us. So, remember everything that I told you. It's actually such a simple command, if you think about it. It is elementary. Why do we need that command? Because we forget. We speak, to the, we speak like that to our children. Our superiors speak like that to us. God speaks like that to us in the same way. Just do what I told you to do. I've said it many times from this stage, but my discipleship mantra is obey right away. If God says something to you, just do it. If you read something and the word speaks to you, do it. And do it right away. No need to measure, uh, measure no need to weigh, just do it. Anybody with kids in the house? Kids, listen. Please undress and get in the shower now. Kids do gymnastics routines, unpack their rooms, and watch an episode of Bluey. Dude, that's not what I told you to do. Do what I told you to do now. Because then you live. Because you guys don't realize that you're hungry, and I want to get you showered so that we can eat dinner. But now you carry all on your own, and then in 20 minutes, it's a total meltdown at home because you're hungry, and I knew it. I'm trying to keep you alive here. Guys, the struggle is real. And all of you that just chuckled know it. Remember what I told you, and do it. That's what Malachi says. So, I mean, remember now, he's finishing off this whole part of the Bible. Two thirds. Last words. Last words. Remember this and do it. It's the first thing. Second, he says, I will send the prophet Elijah before the day of the Lord. And this prophet Elijah will do something. And that something that this prophet will do is to restore the hearts of God's people. Uh, Malach, bra, why Elijah? And who is he? And where does he come from? Did anybody have that question? I mean, going smoothly, going smoothly, Elijah. Let me help you to understand. Elijah was a prophet. He was alive in the time of the Old Testament. We read about him in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, books that tell the history of Israel. Elijah never died. Elijah was taken up by a flaming chariot, and he gone. Elijah did something very significant in the time of the king of Israel called Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Those names should ring a bell. If they don't, it's okay. And here's what Elijah did. Check this. Elijah was a great unifier. Elijah was a great reconciler. Elijah brought the people of God back together. Elijah mitigated relationships between the people of God and their rulers so that everyone got along again. That was his job. Before 
the day of the Lord, Malachi says. Are you guys picking up what's happening here? Malachi says that the great prophet Elijah will come. That's a way of saying someone like him. And that someone like him will do something really important, unify people and reconcile people, so that when the day of the Lord comes, his wrath would not hit everyone, but it would only hit the wicked. That's the promise that Malachi makes. And Malachi says, if that doesn't happen, if there's no unification between God's people, if there's no reconciliation between God's people, the land will continue to be cursed. Are you guys with me? So the Torah and the prophets, the first two-thirds of the Bible, says, at some point, someone will come and unify God's people. Someone will come and reconcile broken relationships. That reconciliation will be like the hearts of fathers turning back to the hearts of their children and the hearts of children turning back to their fathers. What is he trying to do here? He's trying to say it will happen to everyone because fathers sit up top in the family and kids sit down bottom. So it counts for everyone in between. Someone will come and fix these broken relationships at some point in the future. This will be done. Drops mic leaves guys who's he talking about who's he talking about he's talking about jesus jesus was the one like elijah who came jesus was the one who unified and reconciled jesus was the one who's busy gathering the faithful remnant for the last day of the lord we'll get there now what a awesome promise and now Malachi says the whole first two-thirds of the Bible is supposed to tell that story. That's what it's all about. By the way, that's why you should read it. I know of too many Christians who only read the New Testament. Now look, I myself am a little biased. I love the New Testament. So what I do is I read reading plans. That force me to read the Old Testament. So I've got one reading plan from the Bible Project queued. 100 days in the Torah. It's going to be hectic. Genesis is great. Exodus is awesome. And then the law starts. And somehow it feels like I'm reading news. It's news fest. But I have to work through it. Because it tells this great story. That God will one day set right what was broken. So let's summarize what happened. Israel was redeemed by God. We told that in the Exodus story. They then betrayed him with rebellion because they had hard hearts. They betrayed him by breaking the laws of the Torah. Now the scriptures anticipate a future day, this is Malachi, when God will send a new Moses and a new Elijah who will restore God's people and heal their land and heal their hard hearts. This has to happen, says Malachi, otherwise the curse will remain. Did you guys pick up on our theme for today? Rudolf, can I just have our theme slide, please? That's actually where the theme for today comes from. Redemption, rebellion, restoration. That's the story of the Old Testament. And the promise of the prophet in which the whole Old Testament ends is a promise of restoration. Now, this last part that we just read, verses 4 to 6, also presents, like I said, the first two-thirds of the Bible as a gift. We need to read this, we need to ponder this, and we need to pray over this. Why? Because this part of the Bible tells the truth about our human condition. This part of the Bible tells the truth about how selfish we are and how sinful we are. And it also contains God's promise that one day he will send a messenger, show up personally to confront evil, restore his people, and bring healing justice. We're in the time machine still. Will you guys travel back to 2024 with me? One, two, three. Brrr, back in 2024. Okay, so what happened in the meantime? What happened in the meantime is God fulfilled his promise. 
God's promise that he will one day send a messenger and show up personally to confront evil, restore his people and bring healing justice happened. It happened through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself as a human confronted evil, confronted sin, death and Satan and he was victorious over it. Jesus himself restored what was broken. Jesus himself healed what was hurt. God got involved personally in the history of the world. And that's why we have this bridge between the Old and the New Testament. So this phenomenal promise in the Old, 400 years of silence, and then an announcement that a baby will be born. And then a baby in a manger. And then a grown-up man of 30 years old. And then a suffering Messiah of 33. Literally changing the course of human history. And in that, he did something brand, brand new. He birthed something new called the church. He took up residence in his people through the Holy Spirit. He breathed on his people and commissioned them. Now go and tell everyone about this new thing that I did among you. And fam, we are part of that. We live in the pages of the Bible. Because there's a time in the Bible called the church and the spirit. That is where we are now. And then the last part of the Bible is called redemption or restoration. That is what we're waiting for. That is what our hope is in. I want you to know that God made a way for you to not have to face the day of the Lord. God made a way for you to not have to face His wrath and to drink the cup of all His anger. Through His Son Jesus, through His broken body, through His blood poured out for us, through His death on the cross, we don't have to go through this. And it paid in a way that fully and finally satisfied God's wrath, so there's no more payment required. Now on the cross, His arms is open. Come. Anyone. Have you ever thought about that? I know it's a gruesome scene, and I know that His hands were nailed, but He's ready to hug. Arms are open. Ready to welcome anyone. We say at this church, it's as easy as ABC. You admit you're a sinner, you believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. And then you put your trust in Jesus as your only hope of salvation. That's it. That's how you get in. And then you bounce around playfully like a little calf when the day of the Lord comes. Now, let's land with this. Confronting sin, death, and evil, done. But then there's a present continuous in terms of restoring and healing. Do you guys know that God is still busy doing that? God is still busy restoring human beings and through restoring human beings, restoring creation. God is still busy healing human beings and through healing human beings, He uses them to heal others. The story ends with everything perfectly restored. The story ends with everything perfectly healed. So if we are going from here to there, it means that our own healing and our own restoration is a process. And God will be busy with that process until the very last day of the Lord. Do you guys know that there's one more day of the Lord left? The day of the Lord described in the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord where He pitches and He finishes the job. The day of the Lord that you and I should not fear. Why? Because we've been bought, we've been adopted into His family, we've been forgiven. Do you guys realize that? That day of the Lord will come. It'll be hard, hardcore for the wicked that is left on this earth. And we'll get the VIP pass. You guys are in. You can keep going. I just need to deal with these people first. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that great news? I mean, when we were in the time machine and you heard that God is coming for you, I was full of fear and trembling. But now we got out of the time machine after the cross and we didn't have to fear it. We can face the day with confidence. 
We can run to Him. That's why the Christians cried out in the New Testament, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. Do you feel that way? I do. I mean, I love life, but I also think that there's a much better life waiting for us. And especially when I see the brokenness and the injustice of this world, I can't wait to cry out, come Lord Jesus, come. Come and finish the job. Because we know that we'll stand. Great book. Let me offer two possible responses. I want to offer two responses. They might resonate with you. I think uh, one possible response for the book, for the way we finish it now, is a simple prayer. Father God, restore me and heal my heart. That's what was wrong with the people in Malachi. Hearts were hard, made of stone, didn't care anymore, didn't love anymore, didn't respond to God anymore. That's a really good response for us today. Restore me and heal my heart. And that might mean surrender once again. That might mean you saying to God, somehow I started forgetting. Somehow I stopped obeying. Somehow I drifted from you. Somehow I became much more wicked than I am righteous. And I know that that starts with my heart. So will you please heal my heart? Will you soften my heart? Will you make it um, a heart of flesh again? That might be a good response. Another response that I want to offer is, I think this text gives us a lot of hope. And if I look at South Africa, generally, I see a lot of hopeless people. I even see a lot of hopeless Christians. And if there's one group of people that should not be hopeless, it's us. Because we know where this whole story is headed. And we know who's in control. And for me, I often lose hope. But when I read a book like this, and I see that God made good on His promises in this book, and I know that God will make good on His promises again, I'm filled with hope. And then my prayer is, help me to remember. Maybe that's another way to respond to this text. is to say, Lord, give me hope and help me to remember your promises. Let me pray for us. Father God, we praise you for your faithfulness. The faithfulness you showed in sending your Son to unify and to reconcile and to ready us for the day that you've prepared. We thank you that we can look forward to this day as if the sun of righteousness would rise over us, that we would jump around playfully like calves being freed from the pen, that we have the privilege of not fearing this day, but rather calling this day to come. Our hearts become hardened, Father God. Somehow evil and sin has a grip on our hearts. And we stop feeling the love you have for us. We stop showing your love towards others. We stop hearing your word. We stop being obedient to you. Will you give us new hearts like you promised your people? Like you said in the book of Ezekiel, you'll do. Please rip out our hearts of stone. Give us hearts of flesh, attentive and obedient to you. Will you give us hope? Father God, you control everything. You are sovereign over everything. You are holding our story and the story of creation in your hands. May we have great hope that that is where we're headed. Even in times that we might feel like life is being taken away from us. Help us to remember your promises. And help us to, to see and to cherish those promises above all promises that anyone else could ever make us. We look forward to the day. And we pray, come Lord Jesus. Amen.